Welcome to the Open to Hope show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my daughter and co-host, Dr. Heidi Horsley. We've got a great show for you today, and I know it's going to be helpful to all of you who've had a loss, because Heidi, we're going to be talking about the hows and whys of grief support. Grief support is a big issue, isn't it? It is, Mama. We have two really big experts with us today who are very involved in all of this, and they have both also lost their parents, which has really informed the way that they work. Mm -hmm. um, we have Dr. Phyllis Kuzminski and Dr. John Reed, and they both are very involved with ADAC. In fact, Phyllis is the current president of ADAC, which is the Association for Death Educators and Counselors. The, the, I want to repeat that yeah, because you. I don't think <laughs> people know that there's an association yeah. for death educators and counselors. And we'll get into this because this is an important area for you to think about. Do you or your loved one need counseling? There are organizations that can help you out. There are trained people. If you do, but the question is, do you need it, right, Hyde? Absolutely, and Dr. John Reed is the former president of ADAC. Hey, John. So they both have a, this yep. affiliation. So f hello, and Phyllis, Phyllis and John. Hello. Glad hello. to be here. Phyllis is also the author of two books. Yeah. One is called Getting Back to Life When Grief Won't Heal and Attachment Informed Grief Therapy. And she has a private practice in Westchester, New York. All right. And John is a professor at Southeastern Oklahoma State University, and he teaches at the People's University in Beijing, China, and he also is the host of Death Cafe. Ah, all right, all right. Well, thank you both for coming on today. This thank is just great. Well, I want to ask you, what do I do when people come up to me as soon as I've had a loss, I know a lot of you are identifying with this, and say, you've got to get a therapist right now. Have you got them in therapy? Have you got them help? Because they see you grieving, and you're so sad, and everybody wants to fix you, well, right? You know, it's ironic in a way where things have gotten to in that sense, because as H Heidi mentioned, my mother died when I was nine, and of mm -hmm. course then, in the, in the early 60s, there was no grief support. There, there was, weren't even there any were books no out. Grief counselors. There were no books. There was nothing, and so uh, no nobody said to my father. Certainly, you know, Phyllis should have somebody to talk to, or you mm -hmm. should have somebody to talk to. Now, as you say, it's kind of reached the other end of the spectrum mm -hmm. in some way. And on the one hand, given the work that I do, I'm glad that people have an awareness of the fact that. For a lot of grieving children, grieving adults, having s the support of a professional is a good thing. But not everybody needs the support of a professional. I think that everybody needs support. Mm -hmm. I don't think that we're meant to grieve alone. Mm -hmm. I think that people need a place where they have room to express their feelings and where their feelings are accepted and where their feelings are not judged, where they have room Mm -hmm. to feel whatever it is that they're feeling. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people who seek grief support are looking for a place to be able to express their feelings. And so, unfortunately, I think a lot of times when people recommend that someone mm -hmm. get professional help, it's a way of avoiding having to encounter that person's feelings. You know, I'm, I'm thinking when we're talking about this that it's probably the women that they're saying it to. How about the guys, John? I mean, <laughs> I, I don't think most people walk up to a guy and say, you know, you really need to get some <laughs> professional help, right? Right. It's, in the, it's part of the man code, mm. right? Not to, not to do that. But I think it's, I agree with just what Phyllis, mm -hmm. everything Phyllis said, um, that not everybody needs to see a psychologist or a therapist when they're bereaved. But it is important to ask, you know, do you have the support you need? Mm -hmm. um, what are you having the most difficulty with? And, and help do some problem solving with them that, that may or may not involve seeing a professional therapist. Yeah, okay, so I'm listening to this, okay, I don't need a professional therapist, but I'm supposed to be getting grief support. Okay, where am I gonna get it? Yeah, well, mm -hmm. you know, I, I did grief support groups for 16 years. And I used to say to the people in these groups, if we lived in a world where everyone was willing to listen to the stories that you have to tell, we wouldn't need a group. Mm -hmm. But ah, we don't live in that world. And you all have stories to tell, and so this is a place for you to be able to tell your story. So, you know, I think that 
one of the big reasons that people go to groups or again come to see us is that they have a need to tell their story and this is one of the things I say to people who are doing this work because let's face it there are times when somebody tells us a story and it's a very hard story to hear and mm -hmm. we don't know exactly what we can do to help them I say to people if all you do is listen to someone's story sometimes that's the most important thing, mm -hmm. just to have someone have a place where they can be heard mm -hmm. and where nobody is trying to fix them and nobody is trying to tell them that they really should be over it and nobody is trying to tell them that the person who died would want them to, you know, go on. But John, what about the woman who's got the husband who won't tell a story and is not talking about it? Well, I would ask, what, what is he having trouble with? Um, who would he be willing to talk to? You know, does he have a relative? Does he have a co-worker? Does he have a, a, a member of the clergy that he wouldn't have to say, I want to talk about my grief, but if he's just struggling, you know. He How may I not want to talk at all. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the other thing, because sometimes, right. you know, there's a... There's this idea that everybody, I, I don't, you know, people have said to me, does everybody have to talk? Does everybody have to cry? Right. And of course, no, they, they don't. Mm. And I think that particularly in couples, sometimes you can look at the different ways that people are grieving right. and identify that as complementary strengths. Yeah, you know, maybe your husband doesn't cry. Maybe that's not such a bad thing because then there's room for you to cry and he can support you. You know, I've been involved with Compassionate Friends for years, and uh, I would say, what percent would you say are women? Heidi? Seventy, at least mm -hmm. seventy yeah. minimum. Mm -hmm. You know, that's are, true of mental health services yeah, generally. Are, are right. not are not coming right. in, and yet, aren't there some health problems, John, for men who don't grieve? Oh, it easily can turn into um, uh, heart disease or sort of random pains in the body, um, um, reduced immune functioning so that the person gets sick a lot. Um, and, I, you know, the, the, the wife may not see her husband crying. He may be crying in the shower. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he may go off by himself somewhere and cry. I mean, hopefully he'd, if she asks him, do you ever cry, it would certainly be wonderful if he would acknowledge that, yes, he had. But, you know, emotionally, he just may not be able to acknowledge that to his wife. Mm -hmm. um, um, and, and to kind of affirm that maybe they are both grieving um, the way they need to grieve, uh, but, but that it's in very different ways. So, so, John, I'm wondering, you lost your father when you were in your 30s. Yes. Did you feel like you got the support you needed, and how did you show your grief? Um, I was not very comfortable crying in front of other people, okay. but I did cry privately. Mm -hmm. uh, I journaled a lot. Mm -hmm. I, I wrote and wrote and wrote um, and, and never showed that to anybody, but it was just my, it was therapeutic for me. Uh, I was surprised how many people who I barely knew came up to me and said, I lost my father too. Wow. And that may be all they said, yeah. but that was just so healing and helpful to me. Because I, I just, because I felt quite alone, even though I knew everybody mm -hmm. loses somebody, you know. But I felt quite alone, and people I didn't know came up to me and said, "Yeah, peer I support lost my like that, that is powerful." Yes. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering for you too, Phyllis, because I know you said in the '60s people didn't talk about it as much, and here you are, a nine-year-old. Your mother mm -hmm. has died, and right. did you have this? Did, where was your support? Nobody, nobody talked to, to me, and in wow. fact, um, I. It wasn't until my children were old enough where I wanted to have a conversation with them and explain to them that the woman who they knew as their grandmother wasn't my mother. Oh, and wow. It wasn't until then that I had a serious conversation with my father because, of course, saying this to them was going to affect everybody in the family. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, from that point on, my father and I had a, f a few conversations, but... Um, you, I, I'm a little confused. You mean your father had remarried? My, yes, I'm sorry. My okay. father remarried, and so okay. my children thought that uh, my father's wife was their was my mother. Oh my oh, goodness! Wow. Uh, yeah. Um, so there was that not talking about it. So I mean, you were nine. Mm. It wasn't like you didn't have a lot of pictures. And oh know. yeah, oh yeah. No, it was a little weird. <laughs> it, it was yeah, um, but it was a real. It was something that took me quite a while. 
Um, it was very important to me, but it was it took me quite a while to be able to arrange things with my stepmother and with my father so that I could talk to my kids without jeopardizing those relationships. Wow. And it was a wonderful thing, though, when I did, because mm -hmm. um, my daughter in particular started to ask me questions about her grandmother. And, um, and to this day, it relates to my mother as, as somebody who she knows. Uh, uh, how did your mother die? She had uh, tongue cancer. Oh, my wow. God. And so she was ill for a good part of my childhood. Was she was in say. and out of the hospital for a good part of my childhood. And um, one of the things that I learned from that was that I never really um, understood why it is, uh, you know, without having had that experience, I wouldn't really understand how it is that children that age respond w when a parent dies. Because I uh, will never forget that on that day, my father cried, but I didn't mm. cry. I, mm. um, it, because it didn't really hit me right. until later. And I think that it's important for people to realize too that when a child loses a parent, that loss affects them in different ways over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At the same time though, having had that loss, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I'm able to talk to people about when a parent dies, when, and they have young children, mm -hmm. is that children who lose a parent early in life can, can grow up and have, mm -hmm. you know, happy lives and normal lives and that the most important person um, in terms of that adjustment is the surviving parent. Right. And I think it's important for people to know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's good information. That. I, I think, like you said, it doesn't destroy your life. No, it, it really doesn't. Um, I think that's because parents do worry. And I know that John was nodding his head at, at one point. A lot, from a lot of what you're saying I know resonated. Mm -hmm. I know you were in your 30s, but I'm wondering also for you, if you felt you needed to be strong for your mother. Uh, oh, definitely. Okay, because yeah. I noticed you were say, kind I'm of... firstborn mm -hmm. male, firstborn child, and... So yes, I did indeed feel like I needed and, to be And I want to say that it may surprise our audience to know that our number one visit to Open to Hope is adults losing parents. Oh. So I don't oh. want to minimize the fact yeah. that you are suffering, even if your parent was 90 years oh, old, yes. mm -hmm. there is suffering at that loss. Well, I, I wanted to uh, talk about um, I, it, when is grief, uh, not as functional, what would we call it? When is grief? <laughs> it depends on who you ask. But some <laughs> of the things that people call it are um, persistent grief, complicated grief, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, choose your own title. But when it's, am I like, I had right. somebody come up to me after six years yes. uh, whose child had died and said, you know, Gloria, I'm really ready to move on. And I, and I had a good talk with her about it. And she said, I've got it. I'm ready to be unstuck. I'm ready to get out mm -hmm. of it. But it had been six years. Right. So, Which is not know, at all unusual yeah, for right. And, and you resolved a uh, situation with your, your, your family. I mean, things just keep coming things, up, don't they? Yes, exactly. Right. They do. Yeah. But when, how do I know when it, it's, you know, you I need take to, this get, or you want you know. me to take mm -hmm. it? Yeah, John, give us <laughs> no, some uh, of the. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> if, if they're not functioning in some part of their life, I mean, they're they're crying all the time after, after let's say after a few years. Just, what are we just, talking about? Year, they one year or two years? Well, I mean, the average person, you know, gets back to work or to school or something. Right. Even after a few after weeks, a few even weeks. though it's hard. And so, from yeah. the outside, people think, oh, they're doing so mm -hmm. good. You know, inside, they're they feel yeah. like they're walking through mud every day. Right. You know, try and that the the sky is always gray, kind of a thing. Um, um, but, but that's normal. That mm -hmm. is, that's normal, okay. and it's not an illness, and we don't want to. To that's that, that's why we don't We've say we well, need therapy of grief, necessarily. Yeah. Yeah, like the waves, the waves, you know, the crying, the, the there, whatever. There, I think yes, everything that that John said, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think there are a couple of ways to look at it. Really, I think one way to look at it is if you feel like you need help, yeah. ask for help. Right. You know. Um, you don't need a, a definition, do you know what I mean? But the mm -hmm. other, the way that I like to talk about it with people is, you know, it's kind of like an, it's, a, it's like an injury, right? It's like, a, you know, if you think of a bruise, right? Mm -hmm. If you have a bruise, one of the ways, how do you know that, you, that, that it's healing? Because it changes, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's the way it is with, uh, with grief. 
okay. you know, that yeah. with normal grief, it's yeah. not the same all the time. That doesn't mean that it's radically better, but mm -hmm. something And sometimes to you change. get stuck, right? Uh, what about yeah. a trauma, John? What do you do if you have trauma, if you've may, maybe given people mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation or, you know, where you really have a picture in your mind of a trauma? Oh, I, so I have actually have done that. Mm. Oh, uh, wow. I've given someone mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Wow. Um, and I, I didn't realize I would feel traumatized. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, when I got home, my wife said, you're, you're white as a sheet, mm -hmm. you know. Um, um, but, um, I, you know, I was able to talk to her about it, and, mm -hmm. um, and that helped a lot. And then uh, my colleagues, was, this was at a university, you know, and, oh, and, wow. um, and a lot of them wanted to, to acknowledge the, that I was part of saving a student's life. Oh, wow, um, that's and, unbelievable, um, John. I haven't needed to do that since, but I was glad I knew how then. Uh -huh. um, and that you were able to talk immediately and kind of debrief with your wife. Yes, that was very helpful. Yeah. Within the year, there were two of my students were volunteer firemen. Wow. And they didn't do anything. Oh, wow. So imagine the guilt that they felt. Yeah. And I saw them at a conference later, and they both sought me out and needed to kind of share their shame. Mm. You know, and I, you know, and I empathize with their mm -hmm. fear because I certainly felt that same fear. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and tried to encourage them not to feel guilty the rest of their life about this. Mm -hmm. That not we don't all not we don't know how we're going to respond, right? right. You know, uh, right. until we're there. Um, but another thing you had mentioned, or, or a part of the conversation that I want to mention is after my father died, I felt like for the most after with, after several months, I felt like you know I'm doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. When Father's Day rolled around mm -hmm. uh, for five years, anniversary reaction. Th huh? th those Father's Days were rough on me, mm -hmm. and I would be getting irritable and. Mm -hmm. And, and depressed, and I thought, what's going on? And I realized, well, it's almost Father's Day. Yeah. Uh, I had the same exact reaction mm -hmm. after my, after the, the year after my father died. I was sitting with my husband, and mm -hmm. I was listening to him talk about something, and I was thinking, this is really boring. I don't want to really be listening to this. And then I started to think, I don't really want to listen to anything. I'm really kind of bored with any, everything. I'm having this internal dialogue, right? Maybe I'm depressed, and then suddenly the light bulb went off. Oh. It's Father's Day, uh, mm. you know. So sometimes mm -hmm. it, it takes a moment, even for us, because you yeah. think that we're tuned into things, yeah. but, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, things catch you unaware. Ca things catch you yeah. unaware. And, and I want to say to everybody that's watching this, these two are grief experts. Yeah. <laughs> They're talking about normal right. grief reactions. Mm -hmm. right. We're not just blowing it off. No. We're, we're living through it. No. And, and no. we have these feelings. I mean, you want to have feelings. Right. That's you want to remember your true. brother, right? Absolutely, yeah. You don't want to be numb to it. No. But you just don't want it to be overwhelming. But it is interesting because as time goes on, um, you can visit those places, but you recover a lot faster. Right. You know, mm -hmm. you can get very emotional and very overwhelmed, and then your whole day isn't ruined anymore. Mm -hmm. It used to be where if I'd go in those places, it's like, okay, my day's ruined. That's right. Right? You can, sure. you, but your heart, you can still go to those places mm -hmm. if you need to, which yes. is comforting. And in, in a, way. a way, you always need and want to go to those I agree. places. Yeah. Even mm -hmm. if it's only briefly, because yeah. people say to me all the time, it must be so sad to talk to people all the time about their grief. And I always say that the stories that we hear are love stories, I mean, yeah, for I like the most that. part. Yeah. They're love, love stories. That. Yeah. And so, yeah, so, you know, part of revisiting those memories is remembering your love. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. I agree. Well, before we close the show, I want to get some tips from you guys for our audience. So uh, if I've had a loss, and I know, John, you said you wrote, give me some ideas, rituals, anything that comes up for you. And do you want to start with John? Um, well, so for me, in addition to writing, I also f looked for some literature to read on grief. There's a lot and, out there now. Oh, the we so have uh, hundreds of yeah. podcasts and articles. Yes, yes I've referred a lot of people to the YouTube videos that yeah. uh, mm -hmm. Open to Hope has produced. And so many of them, they're, well, they're almost all specific, mm -hmm. different yeah. types of losses mm -hmm. uh, tailored to people's needs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you like writing, what else, John? Have you got any ritual suggestions or anything um, for people? Just making sure to mention my father 
Mm -hmm. um, inappropriate context. And what's his name? Uh, well, he went by the nickname of Ace. Okay, oh, Ace. Yes. His name was Ambers Columbus Reed Jr. Wow. <laughs> wow. I'm so glad I'm not uh, the third. Okay? <laughs> um, but yeah, we everyone called him Ace. And um, uh, he was a mechanic and a man mechanics teacher. And Every time wow. I pick up a hammer to do something, I remember him because oh, he taught that. me th to do those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's big. That's yeah. great. Remembering them with their name, I love that. Mm -hmm. Saying their name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about you, Phyllis? Well, what you are know, some tips I you think got that uh, you know, and, and uh, being mindful of the other people who we're gonna, you're going to be talking to today, I think so much of early grief is about a feeling of disorientation and dislocation mm -hmm. and fear. You know, mm -hmm. and, and who am I now? And so, and will I be able to get back? Yeah, yeah, and so I think that anything that you can do, in a sense, to calm yourself, you know, to mm. find ways to to just whether it's sitting in a chair in the garden in the sunshine, petting your dog, you know, talking to a friend, um, comfort, you know, mm -hmm. to find ways to comfort yourself. I think in early grief, what we need more than anything is comfort acceptance of our feelings and just a lot of room to feel okay about the fact that maybe we're not moving as fast and going as hard at everything as we usually do because we're healing okay. and yeah. we need that yeah. time. Well, Phyllis, tell, tell people how they can get a hold of your book and uh, so, you've uh, got a private practice. Sure. Um, well, uh, both of my books are available on Amazon and uh, other than that, my, I, have a, I do have a website phyllis.kosminski.com. I okay. think I struggle to keep up with these things, Gloria. Um, <laughs> and I also um, work at a place in Connecticut called the Center for Hope in Darien, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So there are a variety of ways for people to get in touch uh, with me. Awesome. And how about you, John? Well, uh, Southeastern Oklahoma State University. Okay. Um, you know, J-R-E-I-D at se.edu. Do you have a private practice at all? Uh, I don't people? currently. Okay. Um, but I. But you do, are doing death cafe on campus, yeah. right? Well, I've that? done the death cafes in, at the Beijing University. Oh, ah, yeah. nice. But, I mean, death is a particularly taboo topic in Chinese culture. But young adults are eager to talk about it. Mm. And that's who, of course, take, take my courses there. One of them is on grief and loss. You quickly tell us how best would you think to find a therapist? What would you recommend? First of all, um, you know, I think you can certainly go to, you know, the, the local hospital. There's, you know, some of the online sources. I know a lot of people find me through Psychology Today. Mm -hmm. Me too. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, and also an organization uh, like, like ADEC can provide referrals. And so if someone is looking for a therapist, that is, another, go yeah, that is another online and go to ADEC. ADEC. ADEC, -E exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And just make sure that you look for Association for Death Education and Counseling, because okay. otherwise you don't know what you'll come up with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I encourage people to ask the counselor who they're going to see what experience they have working with grief. My, my sense of looking at websites is that every counselor thinks they are effective at working with grief. And, mm -hmm. you know, a person needs to have kind of faced their own losses and their own mortality to be yeah. a good grief hey, counselor. Does hey, well, thank you yeah. guys for oh, being on this show sure. today. And we've got to close the show. We're going to have Josh Robinson come on, and he's a musician, teaching artist, and a grief advocate. And he is going to play Compassion for us. Mm -hmm. So thank you guys for being thank on this show. Thank you so much for having us. Yes. And we want to thank everybody for watching this show today. And Heidi and I always want to remind you that if you've lost hope, please lean on ours until you find your own. And God bless. Mm -hmm.